Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful, for the faithful, in oil country and around the world. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David, and welcome, uh, Cult of Hockey listeners and watchers from around the globe. And keep dropping those comments in our YouTube section. And if you're commenting from far away, just drop a line as to where where you saw the game or saw the podcast from. We always enjoy that kind of commentary. It's very encouraging and it's mm-hmm. fascinating just to see people getting that little slice of Edmonton and the Oilers from our podcast from all over the world. Bruce, quite a fun game tonight for for all of us. 7-3, 7-3 over the Edmonton Flames. Oilers, 7-3 or over the uh, Calgary Flames, Edmonton Oilers over the Calgary Flames. And... Um, the uh, it was a it was a uh, contrast in net minding, which we're going to get into shortly. Where where Edmonton's net minding was far better than Calgary's. Grade A chances in the game were sixteen for the Flames and nine for the Oilers. Let's get right to it. Let's get right to it, Bruce. Um, okay. We're going to do two good things each, two bad things, and two numbers. So, what's your first good thing? Uh, tonight, I'm going to give a tip of the hat to Tyson Barry. We don't often mention him among our good things, and uh, he's a little bit of a lightning rod character in Edmonton. It oh. seems like uh, uh, Barry's come in here and basically delivered exactly as advertised, delivering offense from the from the blue line, and uh, uh, for you know pretty pretty fair price, one year contract. And yet, there's a lot of people that just can't wait to see him shipped out of town. They want him gone by the trade deadline or before, let alone the end of this year, and. You know what? Uh, I mean, Tyson Berry was a doubtful starter for tonight's game. He didn't manage to uh, find his way into the lineup, and all he did was score four assists in this game on the second now, the uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth Edmonton goals that basically put this one to bed. And uh, uh, key key helpers in uh, at least a couple of cases, a couple of them, you know, you, you handle the puck enough, you accrue secondary assists sometimes. But it was sure his shot that, uh, yes, I told the RV tipped in out of the air that made it 2 nothing, And it, it sure was his play that that was uh, in the beginning of the three-way passing play uh, from him to dry saddle that Dominic Cahoon finished off, beautiful goal. And it was, uh, you know, uh, he was involved in the offense. He had four shots on net. And here's something for you, David. As of right now, uh, I'm looking at the at the NHL official web page, defenseman points summary. Number one in the NHL, Tyson Berry, Edmonton Oilers. When was the last time you saw an Oiler at top of this list? I'm thinking Paul Coffey. Maybe did. Um... Pronger? No, I guess Pronger probably wouldn't have been at the top. Would Surrey had ever? Surrey had that one big year. He had 53 he points, been. but no, he wouldn't. No, have that's not, not going to lead the league. Would not have been number one. I'm just. I'll look up Pronger mm-hmm. now, just to, just to. That, but that 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 that, uh, that guy Barry, he can make a play with the puck, Bruce. He can make a play with the guy. puck. Yeah, it's enough. You know, it's it's interesting that that, that he. There is a lot of uh, hostility even towards him and Edmonton from yeah yeah it's, it's not and he is listen he he's shaky defensively he is he, he and Bear and Jones have all struggled at times mm-hmm. um, Barry more consistently um, on their defensive play and Barry had some gaffes tonight as well defensively but man he can move that puck and he's got a, he does have a good shot there was the there was really unfair like a lot of people were. There's a play late in the game recently where he, he failed to pass the puck to uh, Drysaddle, who was wide open. And, you know, it would have been a nice pass. But on the other hand, it's late in the game. you got to get a shot on net. He's in shooting position, too. Right. And he's a shooter. Shooters yep. are going to shoot. And I I just thought that that seemed kind of picayune. Much of it, Bruce, is related to the fact that Evan Bouchard um, – is behind him and, and people want to see Bouchard play. I get that they frustrating. They do, I do. But and it's and it's yeah. frustrating in a way, but when they sign him to the one year deal, I thought that's perfect. You know, he can he can be a speed bump for Bouchard as opposed to being a roadblock. And we'll see where they go with it. But let's celebrate the guy we got here right now on the bargain contract, leading the NHL in scoring, twenty eight points. I looked up Chris Pronger, he had fifty six points and he finished ninth. 
24 behind Nick Lidstrom, who was the leading D scorer that year. I mean, that's I'm I'm saying it was Paul Coffey who was the last Edmonton D man to be number one in in scoring, certainly for a whole season and probably for even this late in the season. It's been such a long time, and I mean these guys. I mean, Bouchard's got four points, Bears got three, Jones has got one. Sure, they're promising, but to just say, well, they could do the job Tyson Berry is doing, or you know, maybe down the road they can. But right now, Barry's getting the job done. Uh, he made some good plays tonight, besides the goals. You know, good, good, uh, good moves, good passes. Did get beat out defensively a couple times. That's part of the package. Not too many perfect players out there. You know, it's not too many Chris Browners that are out there that are willing yeah. to sign a one-year deal while you're dealing with a with an injured power play specialist and. Anyway, he's making his time here counting. He's going to sign a nice contract with somebody this summer. He leads the league in NHL in scoring, and he's well on his way. Uh, so we, in second. We did a ye old cult of hockey poll, Bruce, on Tyson mm-hmm. Berry. Um, what is Tyson Berry worth to the Edmonton Oilers on a new deal? So for, the first pick was, uh, well, the first option was $5.5 million a year for three years, which would be a raise in both term mm-hmm. and salary. Right, 14.1% of fans were, were kind of at the high end. Like, you know, that I think that would get it done with Barry if you if you offered that for sure. Then the next option was uh, three years at $5 million a year and 36.9, which was the highest voting total. So there's obviously lots of people who like Tyson Barry fine, Bruce. That would be a good, you know, fair salary probably for Barry. Um, the, the next pick was kind of a bargain contract, similar to the one he's on, three years at $4 million a year. Twenty-seven mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. were in that camp. So those are people that want, they're open to having him back, but they don't want to give him a raise. And the, you know, only if you're a bargain will we have you on this team. And then at twenty-one uh, percent is passed. Let him go. And Bruce, oh, if I'm completely honest, if I'm completely honest, I'm in that camp. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I don't want to see Evan Bouchard blocked, and I think that Evan Bouchard has his, is is going to be as good an attacker as Tyson Berry. There's also lots of other salary cap concerns. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm okay if he signed a bargain contract mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Or, but I just, I, I, so, but I think that, I think too many of us, are, like the problem is, don't wear your GM hat right now. Cause he, they're not, tra- like, I know a lot of people want to trade them high, trade like trade them now. It's not going to happen, nor should it happen when you have a, a chance to win the Stanley Cup. Just let's, let's, Take this player for what he is now and enjoy his, Enjoy a great exactly. game like this. And if he plays badly, we'll, we'll point that out as well. But he's not no. getting traded this year. That ain't happening. So just chill. And I guess people get all worried. Oh, he's going to sign another. No. They're going to sign him to a new contract. And there have been those rumblings, right? We've heard those. So I, I understand people getting. But in the moment when he has a great game, I think you did the right thing here, Bruce, in praising him. That, yeah, they asked him in the post-game interview uh, that... Uh, about uh, now that it, we're into the territory where, uh, according to, I think it was Mark Spector who asked the, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but he suggests we're now in the territory where the one-year contracts can sign an extension. Remember the old rules? You yeah. had to wait until January 1st. You couldn't sign in the fall. You had to wait until basically second yeah. half of the season, which it now well, is. Well, now we're here. And Tyson Berry says, we haven't talked about it. I'm not even thinking about it. My job is to help get the team in the playoffs, and then we'll talk. You know, we'll have plenty of time to talk after the season's over, essentially, is, is what he said. And I thought, yeah, good on you. Do it, you know, get the job done, and then let the chips fall where they, where they may. I mean, he knew right as soon as he signed the one-year deal here that he was auditioning to 32 teams, not one, in terms of where he goes next, because, you know, he's yeah. very, very good possibility he'll be on the, on the open market this summer. But right now, he's an Edmonton Oiler. And he's leading the NHL in defense scoring. And maybe we should just sort of... Savor that. Yeah, yeah. Savor that and just just slack off on the pressure a little bit. I mean, I don't know what, what, what people want. I mean, I guess they want Evan Bouchard playing. They do. And they I do, do too, but... So it's a tough one in that regard. So we can we can understand the frustration. And then yep. they're also worried that Ethan Bear is going to get traded, right? Like they're the big... Yep. And, and um, yeah, so... Bruce, 
we need full information on Tyson Berry. We'll have that when this season's over. We'll, yeah. we'll see him in the playoffs. We'll see how he does then, which is so crucial in evaluating any player. And, you know, people might not agree with that, but, you know, it's a small, small number of games it can be, but the, it says a lot how you play in the playoffs. If he comes up big in the playoffs, maybe you do resign him. Uh, Bruce, this segues to Ethan Bear, who's my good thing. And mm-hmm. um, I just really loved his game tonight. And I thought we saw the Ethan Bear that we saw last year consistently. He just really, he and Chris Russell both played, uh, th- their pairing was strong. Uh, the orders outshot the other team when those two guys were on the ice together. It was, I think Eight it was like nine to four for Bear, nine to three for Russell yep. on shots. And um, listen, there was all, there was 16 grade A scoring chances against Bruce this game. All the other defensemen, all the other defense pairings were out for a lot of chances against Darnell Nurse. Um, Five major mistakes on grade A chance, or just wait, is that is that right? No, nurse four, Darnell nurse four. Um, Tyson Berry. Am I reading the right list here? Sorry. Sure, you got the right game, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, make sure I got the right game. I got about six different games with the scoring chances open in my tabs at any given time. I'll just go off my memory because I think I might have (laughs) the wrong note. Oh, wait, this is game 28 against Ottawa. Tyson Tyson (laughs) Berry. Um, four, mm-hmm. uh, Adam Larson, four, William Loggison, four. So, so all the, you know, the shutdown mm-hmm. demon and the top pairing, they had some troubles on defense, but Russell, uh, won right at the end of the game and Ethan Bear, not one major mistake on a great A scoring chance against nice. work. Good work, Ethan Bear. And what I really liked was his aggressiveness joining the rush, rushing the puck. He actually made some offensive forays instead of sitting back. And being cautious, he decided to go for it. And uh, he was carrying the puck a lot, quite a bit more than usual uh, than we've seen recently. And uh, he's got to do that. He's got, he's, he's a smart hockey player. He makes excellent reads usually. So just, he, he trust, trust his instincts out there if that's what he's doing and go for it. Play, play that, that game that, that came so naturally to him last year, it seems, and uh, impressive performance. Play to your strengths, I say, and, uh, you know, if moving the puck and moving with the puck are your strengths, do them. And, you know, playing as he was tonight with with Chris Russell, uh, clearly uh, Bear is the more offensively inclined one in the in the pair, even though Chris Russell's got six points on the season, which is more than any of the young ones. Uh, it was... Um, uh, they had a, they had a strong partnership in this game, and they were defending well, and they were involved in the attack, and not much to to criticize. Chris uh, Russell I, made a play with without just, a skate without a skate blade. He, he I think he blocked the shot or something like that. He blocked it. He blocked the shot from the point that broke his skate blade. Yeah. Then it went back to the point, and, and Russell was on one knee on the ice because only one of his skates works, and Devin Shore blocked a shot. And then Adam Larson blocked a shot. And this was like very late in the period. The guy's coming out of the penalty box. So they're killing the end of the penalty. And they're just desperately trying to get to the buzzer. And then the puck goes to the sideboards. And Chris Russell is, is sort of in the bottom of the face-off circle on one, on one leg. He can't even skate, right? It's like the table hockey guy where the rod doesn't work anymore. And he's just stuck in one place. And yet somehow he was able to pick off the pa- the centering pass out of the corner. There's like four seconds left in the period, just enough time for Calgary to get a real cheap one because of the you know the disabled player to make it three two. And Russell, of all people, the disabled player, made the super play to intercept the pass. And then the best of all was he struggled to his feet, and Mike Smith came out and just gave him one big Mike Smith push and sent him all the way to the yeah, bench on great. one foot. That was hilarious. Help him off the ice at the end of the uh, at the end of the after the period was over. Bruce, what is your second good thing? Uh, my second good thing is yes, uh, Pugliarvi. I thought he was excellent in this game. Uh, uh, he scored a goal and a, and a rare assist, two points plus one. Uh, his only official shot was the power play deflection he had that pushed it in, but the the, uh, the tipped home Tyson Berry shot out of the point from the point. Uh, but what I loved about that goal was about 10 seconds before that, uh, when one of the orders, I think maybe Drysaddle shot it from the right wing, <laughs> and it, and Paul Yarby was sort of in front of the net, in front of the in front of the uh, left post as as he sees it. 
and it hit some Calgary guy and it bounced away from Paul Yarby and it looked like a Calgary guy was going to clear it. And yes, I did the full dive and he chipped the puck and kept the Oilers in possession. And, and he chipped it to a place where they could recover it and they passed it around two or three times and then back to Barry. And by then, Paul Yarby was back on his feet and and positioned to uh, get a piece of it and tip it down and through Jacob Markstrom and uh, to nothing. So he set up his own goal, essentially, with a great hustle play. Nice to see him tip a goal like that, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Bruce, my uh, second good thing, I think, the story of the game, I think, was goaltending, Mark's, Markstrom's um, <laughs> weak goaltending, and Mike Smith's brilliant goaltending. And I, and I put out a comment that just in the early in the third period that Smith was stealing the game. And it was kind of a funny comment, some people thought, because the orders were so far ahead. But but Bruce, By then. Mike Mike Smith uh, was the difference in this game. If he if he had had a game similar to uh, Markstrom, who knows how this game turns out? It, the Oilers lose this game because Markstrom <laughs> was the typical thing where he wasn't stopping the Grade A chance shots in the first period. The Oilers had two Grade A chances; they scored two goals. Um, Mike Smith, on the other hand, Bruce, he was he was saving all of them early in the game, and I counted. Um, before the the first Flames goal, they had four, which was a five alarm chance in and of itself, and that's like a, a shot that's got like thirty three percent, forty percent chance of going in. They had four five alarm chances before um, mm -hmm. before that that goal. So in the first period, there was um, the uh, Lindholm got two slot shots, came out of the corner, got two really dangerous shots, and and Smith was there and made those. Saves in the in the second period, just early in the second period, Hannafin comes in, charging down the slot, gets a really dangerous shot, and Smith makes the save. And then um, halfway through the um, second period, there's a crossing pass again to Elias Lindholm, and um, Smith makes that stop. So just he's not only was and there was other grade A shots there and other shots that he was stopping, but just these really dangerous, wicked shots. He was finding a way to block as well. Bruce, his puck handling was also spectacular. He was just so sharp. You know, it's funny. It, yeah. it, 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 all, it conjured up an image of Connor McDavid. You know, McDavid has the puck. He's so unbelievably fast and coordinated and smart with it, right? He's just, every move is just so precise and done at high speed. When Mike Smith was going out to play the puck tonight, he just, for, there was a second there where he's like, he was like with such confidence and sharpness. He was as like as sharp as five year old Balderson out there, Bruce. <laughs> he was he was just outstanding with the puck tonight. So what a brilliant performance by Mike Smith. Yeah, yeah, he was real good. And I, I'm hundred percent with you. I was going to explain about his puck handling if you didn't, but I'll explain anyway in uh, concert with your comments. I thought his puck handling was that was a big part of the game. Just yeah. time and again he come out, field the puck make a good clean play, get it out of the zone himself, get it over the first Calgary stick onto an oily stick in the corner or on the hash marks. You know, and just, just, um, uh, he just discombobulated them on the, on the, any kind of shoot-ins. And I, I, he probably had a burn in his saddle after that one that got away on him the other night, but to whatever, he was on this game. And this is another game where you look at it and you say, well, geez, they had two games in Calgary. Smith got beat in the first one. Surely they go to Costin in the second game. And Dave Tippett stuck with his man Smith like he did against Winnipeg a few weeks ago, like he did against Vancouver, where he played both, you know, started both games of the series. We'll probably see Costin tomorrow night. That's fine. Edmonton had to win this game tonight. And they got a, they got a, 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 a major boost from, from their veteran netminder. Yeah. Bruce, what is your bad thing? Well, i got a couple, but I'm going to go, I, I think i got to go with the Calgary intermission panel. <laughs> oh, man, make your teeth hurt. Um, they, got, they had, uh, they didn't have Eric Francis, but they did have uh, um, uh, former what flame, Matt Stajan, Stajan, Stajan and, and former and Vancouver Canuck, uh, Brendan, Brendan Morrison. Man Morrison, who suddenly turns, it turns into a Flames fan. And I'm, I'm really going to point the, the finger more at, uh, at Rogers. When you're broadcasting a provincial game, one broadcast to the whole province, to have a completely Homer-centric 
broadcasts like they consistently do out of Calgary. It just drives me nuts. It's like Edmonton scores a fantastic goal on a seven-way passing play, and the, and the analysis, well, the Flames sure shot themselves in the foot on that one. And it was like four or five times, same the same thing. And enough already, you know, talk about both teams, you know, maybe throw an odd compliment the other way or the odd criticism the other way. I mean, there's two teams out there, guys. And it's like, well, I'm doing Flames broadcast, so I'm here to talk about the Flames. And I, 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 I found it not so much uninspiring as as, as it uh, really was getting my goat uh, to the... Uh, and just the quality of the commentary. There wasn't really much incisive commentary. I will say, Kelly Rudy, I thought he was good tonight. So and did I, Bruce. Color commentary. But the, it's more of the panel between periods that, uh, that just had me shaking my head, thinking, surely we can do better than this. But Rudy has me can't. just now and then gritting my teeth with kind of like semi, you know, like, you know, he's kind of, now the flames are looking better. Like he, he's, you know, hoping to see that. And Perky but he 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 is an excellent analyst. Like he he really knows hockey. I, I find him to be very strong. Like he's way better than John Garrett, who I just adds mm-hmm. nothing. He's a huge mm-hmm. negative. So I, I would I will give Kelly Hurdy props for that. Bruce, my bad thing is when the when the uh, the Oilers got up seven one in the third period, mm-hmm. and there had been two Grade B scoring chances that have gone in. I was hoping uh, that the coach Sutter would call a timeout and, and organize a bag skate for his team right then and there. <laughs> so I'm going to call that a bad thing that he didn't do that. He had an opportunity there. It would have been unforgettable moment and, um, mm-hmm. you know, would have been Sutter, le- Sutter legend added to that. So uh, get the boys out there scraping the ice, give the ice crew a break. There you go. <laughs> give, give them the shovels. That's right. Give them the shovels. Give, give that to Markstrom. All right. Bruce, what is your number? Oh, yeah, bad thing. And Paul Yarby, my previous comment. When Paul Yarby got tackled on what was going to be a breakaway in the first period and the refs didn't call it, that was a bad thing. Man, that was blatant. Anyway, uh, my number, <laughs> I, I'm going to go I'm going to go with uh, uh, contrasting numbers. Uh, one times, well, we'll call it one times two and six times six. And this is the free agent contracts that were given to the two net miners in tonight's game at the beginning of free agency this uh, last year. Uh, the orders went for Markstrom. They offered him seven times five. Calgary outbid them at six times six. And he's a man, and he's a good goalie, but he has good games, but he's not good every game, and he sure wasn't good in this game. And uh, I think he's played, they said he played something like six in a row coming off an injury after he played eight or nine in a row before. They, they need to figure out they've got two goalies. They don't have to kill one and let the other one turn to stone on the bench, but that's their thing to worry about. Uh, Markstrom at six times six, you know, he was the second best goalie on the ice tonight by a considerable margin. And at the other end, Mike Smith, sort of everybody's seventh choice to come back to Edmonton <laughs> on the second day of free agency. He signed Truth. a deal with a significant discount from last year's deal. Uh, where he actually his base salary dropped from two to one point five million, his bonuses dropped from uh, uh, one point seven five to zero point five million. So he you know he took a almost fifty percent haircut in terms of his possible uh, money that he could generate. And in reality, he's probably going to take about a million dollar less uh, pay this year than last. That contract's looking mighty good from where I sit now. And all Ken Holland got was crap for it. And, you know, I mean, maybe these guys know stuff that that we all think we know, but I don't know. I mean, it's uh, Dave Tippett knows his man, and I think maybe Ken Holland does. And, I mean, obviously the season is yet to play out. We all dread the time when Smith goes into that uh, uh, limb-first slump that he, he that he may yet have. But to this point, he's been gold, and he's, you know, he's... Uh, Delivered on the on the saves front, on the on the puck handling front, and frankly, to me, on the team leadership front, uh, he's a big big man in this dressing room, near as I can tell. And they got him at a dirt cheap contract, and he's clearly won the number one job from the much more expensive Mikko Koskinen. And so, credit to Smith, credit to Holland. Let's just look at some of it. My, my number is going to be uh, well. My number 
is related to this. Mark, Markstrom save percentage this year is 903. And um, in terms of goalies who have played 10 games uh, in the in the league in the league this year, mm-hmm. he ranks 32nd overall, Bruce. Uh, Miko Koskinen ranks 34th overall at 901. So they were very close last year in save percentage, and they are very close this year. Uh, it's worth looking at. <clears throat> Goaltending is just so hard. Like so, so let's look at some goalies with big salaries. Matt Murray, 880 save percentage. Martin Jones, 884 save percentage. Um, John Gibson of Anaheim, everyone loves him, but he's got an 894 save percentage. Pekka Rinne, uh, 899 save percentage. Jonathan Quick, 898 save percentage. Frederick Anderson, 900. Um, Sergei Bobrovsky, 905. Carey Price, 907, ranks 23rd in the league. Um, so Mike Smith is, um, 920 Bruce, 920 save percentage ranks ninth, ninth in the league. And other goalies in the top, top 10 include Kapo Kakonen, Philip Grubauer, Jake Allen, Calvin Peterson. So it's just a weird position, isn't it? In terms of trying to figure out who to invest your money in. And what's a good bet? What's a bad bet? It just seems more random. And this has been known for some time. This isn't news, but it's just hitting me over the head right now this year. It's just how random it is in terms of who's going to come up big and carry a team and who isn't. Vasilevsky's still right at the top, of course. So um, he's the one guy. And Mark andre Fleury, who, but he had a bad year last year, Fleury, but he he's did. rebounded. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, it's very interesting, the, that position yeah. and what what you're going to do, where you're going to spend your money. Uh, well, you talk about Martin Jones. I mean, San Jose, he was good for a few years for them. And then they committed a big, long contract to him, six or seven years, at not close to six million bucks, I think it was. And now it's two, if not three years in a row that he's been poor. And they're stuck with it, you know. And, and you have um, in Florida, Sergey Bobrovsky, the seven times ten million yeah. dollar uh, contract that won me that won me the Diet Coke lottery there that time uh, and uh, with uh, we had a bad friend uh, Colin Ruddle and uh, and uh, John Short and a few other people anyway uh, I guess seven times ten with Florida for Bobrovsky and it was exactly perfect uh, prediction so that one worked out, but he hasn't worked out at all for Florida. He's he's been bad, and he's in the way of their better goalies, Chris Dreger, and they they don't know what to do because they have one goalie whose contract's an absolute boat anchor, and an up and comer who, you know, they haven't necessarily got the budget for him. So Dreger's a name for Oilers fans to watch going into the summer, I think. But that's down the road. Uh, so going short term with a with a proven veteran is. You know, you might criticize the veteran, but I mean, in terms of contract, um, sort of managing the cap, uh, that was a very low bet that um, Holland put in Mike Smith. And you remember the circumstances, the day that he made the bet, he had about five million left in cap and he used 3.75 of it on Tyson Berry. And about a half hour later, they announced they'd signed Mike Smith and they basically filled in their their roster at that point, and they spent the money that they were going to spend on Markstrom, they spent it on Barry, and then they wound up, you know, getting Smith at a bargain rate, and the question was, was he going to be able to to be any good at all this year? And the answer to that is clearly, unequivocally, yes, he's going to be very good. You know, there's been other times, I was just trying to think whether we saw ever saw Mike Smith look this good last year, and my, my, my inclination is to say no. No, we never did. Now, I'm looking at my p- performance rankings for the year, and there was a couple times where I had him as the fourth best player on the team and the fifth best player of the team at the start of the year and at the end of the year. Oh. October, he was the fourth, and March, he was the fifth best. So there was times when he was really good. He didn't but, get there by playing, by being anything but, you know, very good to get in the top five in your rankings on this team. Yeah, so he, but right now, he's probably about number three, and... um and uh, he's, he, he didn't, he looked good at times last year, but man, he's just looking f- utterly fantastic. Like I said, he, he had that, Mc, 
McDavid-esque quality when it with, with when he was with his movements. He was so sharp. You know, if he someone was telling me he was the oldest player on the ice, he was just unbelievably quick and limber. So uh, good for you, Mike Smith. Whatever your uh, regimen was in the off season and whatever you're doing now in terms of diet and exercise and sleep and all that stuff, taking care of yourself, it's working because you're playing like like, like you're in the absolute prime of your career right now. Yeah, he's got, uh, he, I keep hearing people who, who are somewhere on the inside saying he's a fantastic athlete, like just raw athleticism. Yeah. And I mean, he, he last year from, uh, from January 1st through uh, basically right up until just before the lockout, or sorry, the you know, shutdown the pandemic, the shutdown lockout. Why would I default to lockout? And he was like, uh, overtime loss, one, two, three, four, five wins in a row, overtime loss, three more wins in, in a row, one loss, a win, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six games in a row with either a win or an overtime loss. So, you know, he was getting at least he the result good. from yeah. almost every game for like 10 weeks. I think he had two clear losses in 10 weeks and, and something like 18 starts in that time, 17 starts in that time. So thing is when he has an off night he looks bad like he does have that that um sure curse and there are players at other positions you know they have a curse of when, uh, when things aren't going their way they just they just look terrible and you just want to dump on them but uh he had he didn't have very many of those nights in 2020 uh, unfortunately he did have that one afternoon in august that yeah, soured really... a lot of people on him Including, and including, now in 2021, he hasn't had many bad nights. Yes, well, including both of us, to be, yeah. to be clear. Yeah. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there. Let's. Uh, we got Winnipeg tomorrow night, and so um, sure do, Kurt's right doing the game grades tonight. It's probably posted. Well, I'm right sure. Now. I'm sure not doing them. The Oilers well, won. <laughs> I wasn't going to mention it, Bruce. I wasn't going to bring that up. So let's not. Let's not go there. Am I doing them low tomorrow? I'm low doing tie. Them. Yeah, you are. Yep. Yep. Fans, you're safe. David's doing them tomorrow. Night. Yeah, I don't low, know. Low about Tide that, actually but... asked me on the on the radio on my weekly spot on the <laughs> low down with Low Tide today to detail my sorry record in games this year. So I said you. we keep our future a deeply a deeply guarded secret as to who it will be, so we don't influence in advance well, what uh, players are going to do. But it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> anyway. You know what? I there was one year when I had all the losses. Mm -hmm. And I remember it actually felt bad, you know, in this weird oh, it way. Frustrating. It felt bad. <laughs> so, yeah, and you, it's just yeah, we're we we are we are irrational and superstitious superstitious creatures at some level. So uh, it's hard to it's hard to shake that that thought. Eight so. o'clock game, over at eleven. You're sour about the loss anyway. Podcast midnight. Now I got to write about that pig, you know. And it's like the night stretching <laughs> on in front of you. So. And it comes with the territory. But when the team is good, you kind of expect to have a lot of good games to write about. And it hasn't quite happened yet. But I think the team is good, and I think I'm going to get some wins there. How's that? Yeah. What is your record this year? 0-15? Uh, I'm 4-9, and nine, <laughs> and you're 7-2, and two, and Kurt is 8-2. and two. Holy moly. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So. <laughs> okay. Let's leave it there. Bruce, yeah, thanks let's for leave it there. Yeah, th thanks for... Uh, Thanks for listening and commenting, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.